from the Corinium Chief Analytics Officer Conference, Spring, San Francisco. It's the Cube. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're in downtown San Francisco at the Corinium Chief Analytics Officer event in Spring 2018. Really, a ton of practitioners for such a very small event. Super, super intimate. Super, super customer stories and practitioners. So we're really excited to have our next guest. She's Perdita Parik. She's the head of Enterprise Business Analytics for Silicon Valley Bank. Welcome. Thank you. Good so, to be here. What do you think of the show? It's kind of an interesting little uh, little event. I personally do think that they do an amazing job of organizing this particular event. And out of all the events throughout the year, I try to choose and come to this event. Right. Very good. So you were just on a panel yeah. with a bunch of practitioners. For the folks that didn't attend the panel, what were some of the interesting things that came out of it, some surprises? I think one of the main surprises that I had as you know one of the panel members is the audience. And the audience actually did say um, that not 99% of the people have issues working with other virtual teams within the bank or within their, their own organization. And many people have tried to figure out how to work together, and that right. was very pleasant surprise to me. And they're and they're working better together. Absolutely, from what you said it's a high productivity when you try to uh, work work things out together. Well, what's going to happen to shadow IT if the IT department is suddenly <laughs> easy to work to work with? Well, I don't think it is either the department or a person that is difficult to work with. It's, I think, more of a clash of cultures right. between the two groups. And IT does need, for their own right reasons, to have a process in place and go by the rules so that they can keep the company safe from compliance and regulation perspective. Right. Whereas analytics, by nature, needs to be creative and has to focus on time to market. Um, and they have to be agile and work really fast enough, and right. so they can't have the bandwidth to follow the process. So it's more of a clash of two cultures. Right. And I think we need to open up the boundaries and think about virtual efforts to be able to get something done. Now it's interesting because we always talk about people, process, and tech, and, and you know we go to tech. They're called tech conferences. They're not called yeah. process tech conferences. Yeah. And so there's a lot of focus on the technology and the new shiny object, and mm -hmm. whether it's Hadoop or Big Data or Spark or you know all, all this fun stuff. But as you just said, really the harder part is the people, people and the process. And as you just said, culture really is derived from the processes and, and the responsibilities that you have under your under your jurisdiction, I guess. Yeah, so. Absolutely, and I personally, I don't know, I personally feel technology is not an end by itself. It's a means to an end. Right, right. And so the success of a company is where how you embrace, how people embrace technology leads to results. Right. It's neither technology nor people on their own, it's how they embrace technology is what leads to success. So I wonder if you can share some insight from your experience at Silicon Valley Bank. You're, you're the head of the analytics group. Mm -hmm. You know, banks are interesting to me because banks have been data driven forever, right? There isn't really any money in a, in a bank, in a, in a room somewhere. It's, it's numbers on a page and numbers on a database. Mm -hmm. um, and all your products are pretty digital. So when, when you start to bring more advanced analytics and you try to change the culture a little bit and, and, and run through the overused digital transformation, what are the, some of the things you're looking at? How are they transformational? And what's kind of the acceptance in the, in the broader team, as you said, when there can be some culture clash and you have regulation and you're a regulated industry and there's, there's real issues and barriers that you have to right. overcome. So uh, barriers are always there in any organization, in any industry, particularly when you're introducing a totally new way of making decisions. And when the company is very successful based on making intuition-based decisions, it's hard for you to sell the idea that, you know, I can give you information and that will expedite your decision-making process. So I think when I joined the bank, I didn't realize, but 99% of my job was to be the change agent. <laughs> <laughs> Not and an I, easy job. And, and the storyteller. Right, because right. unless you tell the story and sell the idea, you are not able to bring the change. Right. So yes, there are barriers and there are always going to be barriers, but I personally like challenges, so I embrace the challenges and try to overcome. So what I ended up doing is I started thinking about where can I have IT add value and where are the opportunities where I can value them. So instead of me going to the business and talking to them about what we can do together, I brought that team member along with me. 
So that visibility and transparency made them feel valued and they were more than willing to partner with right. me. And so that changed the, the landscape to work with IT. But on the other hand, from the business side, you know, I personally think that unless you have one or two examples, and one of my first example was a business process and it used to take, you know, a number of hours and I reduced it by 10, you know, leave it only 10% of that time. And they said, oh, wow, that does make sense. What can we do more? Can we partner on this? So initially, first quarter, I had 20 questions and requests. And the second quarter, first whole year, we had only 20 questions and requests. And the following quarter, we had 200 of them. Wow. So when you're looking for an opportunity to apply your skills mm -hmm. and your knowledge to bring some change to the organization, how much of it is you kind of searching for inefficiencies, say, in an internal business process, versus maybe a business stakeholder saying, wow, you know, if we could only do X, or I have this problem, um, can can you help me find the root cause? So it probably makes such a unique institution, because it's got a couple of segments that it really focuses on. Mm -hmm. um, obviously in tech, a little known wine business, I think you guys do yes. a lot of investing there, because tech guys tech like banking. open wineries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you've got some really small specialty segments. So how did you find some of those early opportunities? You see, it, you know, when you do something and it's successful, it's a two-edged sword. You know, things keep coming and the demand grows exponentially, you know, fast. It's an exponential growth rate. So what we had to do was really focus on what matters the most. And that came only from two-way communication with the business as well as with the executive team. So if the executive team, we realize that this is the revenue generating opportunities, here is where we can make a difference, we focus on it and show them the value. Or if it is a process that really needed some attention and we could benefit from cost effectiveness. So there was a kind of an ROI framework where we focus on it. But to be very honest, we didn't have to look far to look for opportunities just because revenue is the main focus for right. business as right. well as executives. Right. So it was a two-way communication that helped us really identify, but I didn't have to hunt for opportunities because you know, that's where your experience come into play. Right, right. So I'm just curious on the revenue yeah. side, where you look, just, you know, again, the question always comes up, how do I get started? How do I get yeah. started? How do I get early wins to build to build momentum in my company? So was it customer retention? Was it mm -hmm. uh, cross-selling? I mean, what were some of the, the things that you saw that, that were revenue tied, with, and everybody mm -hmm. likes being tied to revenue, where you thought you could have some success? So, I mean, my idea of really making a difference is very simple. What does the business focus on? How does a bank operate? They have to get new clients and increase the size of the cake or the size of the clientele that they have. So acquisition is one area. Okay. The second is, once you have them, how can you help have them deepen their relationship with you so that the switching cost to another bank is higher? Right. And the third is, once they are with you, you also want to retain them in many different ways by increasing client satisfaction. And then, of course, cost effectiveness, how do you plan your staffing needs and capacity? So I started in each of those areas, at least taking up you know, one or two business questions and showing them the value, and now it's covering all those spectrum of analysis. That's great. So now you've got more, uh more inbound opportunities for a place to apply your analytics than you probably have people to, uh, yes. to apply them. <laughs> That's a good problem to have. <laughs> That's a good problem to have. Well, I'd just love to get your take, too, on, on, on kind of the, the higher level view of kind of the democratization of the data, uh -huh. of the d data itself, of the tools to operate the data, and then, of course, hopefully, if you democratize the access and the tools, hopefully when somebody finds something, they actually have the power to implement it. So how have you seen that environment change? Um, not specifically at Silicon Valley Bank, but generically over the last couple of years within your career? Well, I personally think that in my career in different organizations, democratization is a necessity, is no longer a topic of discussion. It is something you have to do because analytics in general is an enabler community and you can't have as many enablers as you have the people who are users. So how do you really create a, you know, analytics center of excellence by giving them the ropes and tools to fish for themselves right, or to right. find their own insights and create their own stories. Right. So what I did and has worked really well is create a virtual team of Analytics Center of Excellence where it's not only my team members but it's some other pockets of analytics teams but at the same time the users themselves. Right. And they become the advocates of what you do and as far as tools are concerned 
you know, we used to have an era where you have IT controlled tools to be able to democratize and give the insights, and now it is user um, driven tools. So we did move from one, spec one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum so that it becomes easy for the user to actually grasp the insights. Right, right, and so, still maintain control yeah. and governance. Oh, and yeah, security, yeah. information security right, control right. is a big one, right. and we, we can maintain right. that. And as far as the governance and the data, I mean, they're not pulling their own definitions and other things. It's based off of information foundation, which is solid and scalable. Solid. Okay, so give me the last word. Um, you've said the word story at least four yeah. times, <laughs> maybe more since we sat down. I want to check the transcript. What if you can expand a little bit on how valuable storytelling is in this whole process. I think it gets left off a lot, right? Mm -hmm. People want to focus on the math and focus on the technology and focus on the whiz bang and the flashing flashing lights and the data center. But you keep saying story. Why mm -hmm. do you keep saying story? Why is story so important? You have multiple stakeholders. First thing is the executive team. They do not have the time. I mean, they are focusing on so many different aspects that they don't have the time enough for anybody to go through the whole textbook or whole you know chapter. So if you can tell them story in 30 seconds in an elevator or three minutes on a hallway and then request for 30 minutes, you're bound to get some time with them. And in that short time, would you rather show them the value that you can bring to the table or would you show them how the sausage is being made? Right. And so that's where one type of storytelling is important to sell the idea. The second is the working team who we are working with. And I have seen that unless you tell your story and sell the story, you can't get their buy-in. And that virtual team effort that I was talking about fails miserably. So that's another area where you need to tell the story. And the third is once you have an analytic product, then how do you get adopters? So to tell the adopter what is in there for them right. is a storytelling right. too. Right. How Small would, detail, yeah. actually getting yeah. people to use it <laughs> for their benefit. All right, well I think this is so important because as, you, as you've mentioned a number of times, it's about people and people working together, teams working together yeah. in this collaborative effort to make it happen. As I think somebody you know, else they, said, it's a team they, sport, The right? interesting that they have seen is now that I come to these conferences, there are five people, at least in different five companies, they said they've hired a journalist on their team because they realize the storytelling is so important. Really? Yeah, so the hybrid function analytics we say requires data engineers, data scientists, statisticians, um, communicators, story weavers and tellers, which is a journalist, and then a change agent and project manager. That's why they bring the cube. <laughs> we try to tell the story. So thank you for sharing your thank story. You so I really much. appreciate the time. All right. Thank you. You're watching the cube from the Corinian Chief Analytics Officer Summit in San Francisco. Thanks for watching.